Hello and welcome everyone tuning in to Zico Law's weekly Wednesday webinar. My name is Kevin Hawkins and I'll be your moderator for this week's session. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank all of you for joining us today. We would like to keep this session interactive, so please feel free to type in questions that you would like me to ask our speakers. We may not be able to answer all the questions during the webinar, so we encourage you to leave your name and email address so we may connect with you after the session. And today's topic is managing anxiety in times of uncertainty. Recently and currently, we have all had to deal with the fear and anxiety about a new frightening disease, COVID-19. And thus we are faced with overwhelming stress of uncertainty about what happens next. Social distancing measures, including working from home, may lead to feelings of loneliness and despair. We also worry about our financial situation and the loss of support services we usually rely upon. How do we manage all of this stress and anxiety? Today, we have with us two distinguished wellness advocates who will share their stories and perspectives as well as provide us useful exercises that we can adopt. It is my pleasure to first introduce Ms. Emma Noguchi. Emma is an executive and leadership coach who works with leaders from all sectors to increase their self-awareness, develop trust, and unleash their full potential. She manages her own coaching practice, coachinggoware.com, to help leaders and their teams boost resilience, increase their well-being, and achieve outstanding results. Welcome, Emma. It is also my pleasure to introduce Mr. Richard Martin. Richard leads the mental health work at leading workplace consultancy firm, Byrne Dean. He began his career as an employment lawyer, and in 2011, he experienced serious mental illness for which he was hospitalized and spent two years in recovery. He now works with organizations around the world to raise awareness of mental health issues especially in the legal sector. In 2018, he published a memoir of his experience in his book titled, This Too Will Pass, Anxiety in a Professional World. Welcome, Richard. And now I will turn this over to Emma to explain to all of us calmly what causes anxiety and stress. Thank you, Kevin. Let me share uh, my, my slides. I have a few, few slides I wanted to show you. Um, so here we are. So thank you, Kevin, for this warm introductions and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're located. Very pleased to be here with you today and talk about anxiety. As a coach, I work with a lot of leaders and managers to really increase their self-awareness about what's happening at any moment in time, especially in their inner world, and find and help them find strategies to manage themselves or the emotional states so they can continue to be effective for themselves, for their teams, for their organizations. So today I'm, I'm gonna be talking in quite a lot about the importance of raising awareness, especially self-awareness. But before we do that, I wanted to share a little bit about the trend about anxiety today, anxiety and stress. So first of all, even before this whole pandemic um, started, employee resilience and mental health were already at stake in many organizations across the world. Why is that? It's because our modern world is changing at a faster pace than ever. It's highly VUCA, this is a new trendy term, highly volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And now with the advent of COVID-19 and this global crisis that you know, has spared none of us, that trend has accelerated even further. And so with more and more employees working from home, having to deal with their children, do homeschooling, and of course, all the anxiety linked to the virus and our own well-being, our loved ones, uh, as you can imagine, it's, it, it's, uh, it's increasing the level of anxiety and stress. And as a result, it affects pretty much everything, our, our lifestyle, our performance at work um, and, and people around us. Just in Singapore, I, I'm, I'm where I'm located, I, I, I found some data about uh, the amount of uh, money Singapore was already spending with, for stress-related illnesses, and that was pre-COVID. 
2019, it was already about 3.1 billion Singapore dollars a year, almost 20% of the country's total health expenditure. Post-COVID, we don't have the uh, data yet, but as you can imagine, that amount may have doubled, if not tripled. So it is a big deal that we need to pay attention to. Uh, but let's move on to really anxiety as a topic. And I want to start by debunking a myth here. It is actually absolutely normal to feel anxious. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually about being human. And actually, if you were not uh, feeling any anxiety, I'd be worried. Um, it, it's, we see, see it a bit more as a signal that tells us you need to pay attention. Something is happening here and we need, yeah, we need to address that. Now, of course, feeling anxious uh, um, at certain point in our life and our work is fine, but too much anxiety then could lead to stress or chronic stress and that's where uh, things can derail. So let's look at what causing anxiety and and this some I've put some of my some of my clients examples uh, here. Typically uh, a demanding clients always asking me for more and more or a spouse that is constantly criticizing me criticizing me because I'm not uh, at home on time for bedtime or peers putting in more and more hours and I want to get that promotion and therefore I feel compelled to do the same and, and doing more. Or it can even be an inner voice. Yeah, I'm not good enough or I'm a fraud. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm not. So all those could be cause of anxiety. And of course, the uncertain environment we live in, where we may lose our job, we may have to relocate back, um, or aging parents we can't visit because the borders are, are closed. So of course, this is just a few examples. There could be many, many, many causes that um, trigger anxiety in us. And of course, we have different thresholds. What causes anxiety to an individual may not be the same to another individual, and there's no right or wrong here, really. The most important part is really for us to be aware that when we have lost a sense of safety, of harmony or inner peace, and we start feeling agitated, um, and that's really where, where anxiety starts. Now, um, I wanted to quickly touch upon what's happening in the brain and a little bit of neuroscience, and I'm going to keep it really, really easy. But it's important to understand that as human beings, we have an innate need for certainty. Um, and that's come from our ancestors, the cavemen and women that were constantly scanning for danger. Otherwise, they risk to be killed by predators. And therefore, we are, our brain is really hardwired to all constantly look out for danger. Um, and we have different part in the brain, but the primitive brain, or we call it the instinctive brain, is really that part of our brain that look for danger and that, that also needs certainty. And especially when our environment is full of uncertainty, when we don't know what's going to happen, that's where that part of the brain get really trigger, triggered. And typically we go either into flight, fight or freeze mode. Um, and what's what happened then is that the other part of the brain that we call the executive brain is usually the center for helping us prioritizing, planning, organizing. It's also where we can activate cognitive and logic and, and being rational because it, it shuts down when we are in threats or when we feel that it, there's uncertainty around us. We can't function well, we can't think very well, and that's when we start feeling uh, acting irrationally. Now, there's another part of the brain called the limbic brain that is more the center for emotional regulation, for memories um, and, and also learning. And because that, uh, that brain is also affected, we can't learn very well. We can't, we can't regulate our emotion. And, and that's often when we feel overwhelmed by our emotions due to stress or anxiety. Um, I also want to show you this uh, model called the Kubler-Ross change process, or it's also called the grief, uh, grief model uh, that was developed by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a psychotherapist who was wanting to understand how her patients deal with loss or grief. And typically we go through a curve and this is perfectly natural for us to go through that. It starts with a, a shock, something has happened, and we either confused or shock or in fear, and we freeze typically. Then we go into 
some emotional response, anger, sadness, irritation, anxiety. And when it goes worse, that's where we fall into depression and we're completely overwhelmed and we can't function at all. And then hopefully at some point we can go back up into bargaining and acceptance that when we that's when we start dealing with our emotions and our anxiety and then we effectively can be functional again. So it's important to know what's where we are in that change process and I'm going to talk a, a, about it a little bit later. But there's another thing that uh, I also wanted to share uh, and I'm working with my clients uh, on those three levels because they are highly interconnected. Our mind, typically the house of our thoughts and beliefs and, th and, and you know, the, the, our, our thoughts constantly um, thinking most of the time when we are awake. Our heart is really the house of the emotions and the feelings. And finally, the body with multiple sensation at all times, good, bad. Um, and I want to pay attention here to disease, which it's actually the absence of ease and our body starts to, to be sick or to, to be ill when we feel not at ease. And finally, the environment that surrounds us, it usually can cause us to feel at peace, to feel certainty, or to, can be a trigger for anxiety. And so it's important to know that everything is interconnected because when we start having, let's say, a negative thoughts, so we start with the mind, the mental, and for example, the, the negative thoughts could be, I'm not good enough for this, or I'm not ready. Then usually it will trigger an emotion, the negative emotion. It could be, I feel helpless or I feel useless. Or it could start with an emotion and then it goes into a negative uh, thought or belief. And sooner or later, it will start affecting our physiology, our body. We have start having tension, uh, poor posture, heaviness, migraines, and, and worse sometimes. So it's really important to understand that everything is really interconnected. And our environment, again, are we evolving in an environment that promotes us to be safe and to feel secure, or we need to address the environment because it's not helpful? So I just want to uh, offer you a quick self-awareness here, a self-awareness exercise that you can do at any moment in time and, and you start going through one level after the other and asking yourself, am I thinking any negative or limiting thoughts right now? Or do I have a negative belief that's not helpful? And how am I feeling? Good, bad, happy, sad, elated? Am I, am I feeling abandoned, rejected? There's such a wide range of emotions that we usually don't dive in, but it's important to really kind of understand how we're we really, really feeling. And then what sort of sensation do I feel in my body? Again, is it helpful and helpful? Is it um, ache? Is it numbness? And so on. And, and kind of have that scan in our body to help us really sensing what's going on. And lastly, the environment. Uh, again, is it helpful or not helpful? And is there something I can change in my environment to make it more certain and, and less prone to anxiety? So is that Kevin, um, over to you. Thank you, Emma. I actually, I, I, I love your, your slideshow. Usually images and diagrams of brains can be rather creepy, but you managed to make it so much nicer with rainbow colors. <laughs> so appreciate Thank you. that. And, and uh, now we'll, we'll hear from Richard about his own experience and how that has shaped his work with others. Thank you, Richard. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you for having me join you. <coughs> Excuse me. Goodness. Um, <coughs> that's better. Um, <coughs> I like to I like to read books. I find books very helpful. So I thought I would begin by just giving you a short quote from a book that I found incredibly helpful when I was first ill, and it's a book called Depressive Illness: The Curse of the Strong by a psychiatrist called Tim Cantifer, and it was particularly helpful when I first got ill because of because of this. He says, "Depressive illness." or at least the commonest sort, which is caused by stress, nearly always happens to one type of person. That person will always have the following personality characteristics. And I just want you to think about whether any of these resonate with you as I read them through. Moral strength, reliability, diligence, strong conscience, strong sense of responsibility, a tendency to focus on the needs of others before one's own, sensitivity, 
vulnerability to criticism and self-esteem dependent of, on the evaluation of others. <clears throat> and when I read that, first of all, many years ago now, I thought, oh my goodness, that's me. And I know that it's also so many of the, the people I work with, the lawyers that I know. And Kanzefer goes on to say that this person is the sort of person you would turn to if you had a problem to sort out on which your house depended. They're a safe pair of hands. You can trust them with your life. Indeed, this person is usually admired, although often somewhat taken for granted by those around them. And people are usually pretty surprised when they get ill. But it isn't so surprising because depressive illness is a physical condition. If you give a set of stresses to somebody who's weak, cynical or lazy, they'll quickly give up and they'll never get stressed enough to become ill. But a strong person, on the other hand, will react to those pressures by trying to overcome them. After all, they've overcome every other challenge they faced in the past through diligence and effort. So they keep going, absorbing more and more until inevitably symptoms emerge. At this point, most people would say, hang on, too much, give up, stop. So they pull back from the brink before it's too late. But the sensitive person without a very solid sense of self-esteem can't stop struggling because they fear other people being disappointed in them. And even more than this, they fear being disappointed in themselves. And so they keep going on and on until suddenly, bang, the fuse blows. And that's pretty much what happened to me. As I was a pretty good boy, um, <clears throat> I grew up doing as I was told, working hard. Um, and by the summer of 2011, aged 41, I had a pretty good life. I had three young kids, a beautiful wife, the lovely house, a holiday home in Europe, in France. I was on the management committee of my law firm um, and my next job was going to be running it. Uh, I was a school governor. I chaired a local community group. I worked in the church. I was doing everything because I was exactly the person that Cantifer is talking about. The sort of person that I recognize now on a regular basis. I never said no to anything. I always said yes because I feared being judged by other people, but probably mostly being judged by myself. Um, and I'd been feeling under pressure for quite a long time, stressed if I'm honest, but I kind of thought that that went with the territory. And I was kind of terrified of admitting to myself or to others that maybe I wasn't coping. And so for months, maybe years, I've been experiencing what Emma's described in terms of those anxiety feelings, those stress feelings. But crucially, I wasn't doing anything to address it. I just carried on trying a little harder all the time. And then and then one day it all blew up in my face and that of all of those around me. Um, we were <coughs> coming home from a holiday in uh, in France. I was driving the family around a motorway south of Paris and suddenly completely out of the blue. I felt desperately, desperately ill, that disease that Emma was talking about. But more than the kind of physical stuff, so the physical stuff was my heart racing, my I was feeling very sick, my breathing was out of control. But more than that, my thoughts were completely confused. And all I could think was I needed to escape. I needed to get away from where I was. So I stopped the car in front of, in, in the middle of lots of lanes of fast moving traffic and got out and tried to walk to somewhere where I could feel safe. Which, of course, isn't a good idea on a busy motorway. Um, so eventually somebody stopped me and asked me what was I doing and I kind of said well I, I don't really know um, <clears throat> but then they eventually closed the motorway and I was able to get to somewhere safe and eventually kind of into hospital and medical care and I guess I kind of went pretty much overnight it seemed at the time from being somebody who could cope with everything um, to somebody who could cope with nothing and every time the dog barked or the children spoke or the doorbell rang or the phone rang I was terrified and I was hiding behind the sofa. I was in tears. Um, and it literally at the time, as I say, it seemed like it happened overnight. It didn't, of course. There was a long period of build up. It's just that I wasn't paying attention to myself. I wasn't aware of what was going on. And to the extent that I was aware of it, I wasn't doing anything about it. Um, and I, so I spent a month in hospital um, and I spent a couple of years after that kind of recovering um, to get to back to a place where I felt I could kind of come back into society, if you like, get back into the world of work and other things. Um, and there's a couple of conversations along the way that I just wanted to kind of mention, which I think they're quite helpful in terms of well, understanding the process, the progress. So when I was first talking to my psychiatrist about being admitted to hospital, at this point, my family and I had decided that we I wasn't coping at home and they weren't coping with me. So we went to see my psychiatrist and he said, well, would you like to be admitted to hospital? 
And I said, well, I, I don't know. You're the doctor. You tell me. And he said, no, 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 no. You have to decide. It's up to you. So I said, OK, help me here. Am I ill enough to be admitted to the hospital? And he said, yes, yes, definitely. Don't worry about that. You are definitely ill enough to be admitted to hospital. OK, I said, um, what are they like in there? And he said, well, they're like you. And that was one of those moments of kind of revelation to say, yeah, this mental illness thing, it doesn't happen to other people. It's not about other people. It's about us. It's about us, our friends, our colleagues, our family, the people we know. It's people like us. And sure enough, when I went to hospital and spent a nice month there, the people there were like us. And I think that's a really important thing to kind of keep in mind, that it's easy to protect ourselves by imagining that this stuff that happens is about other people. It isn't. It's about us. And we need to take our own well-being um, seriously. And the other conversation I was going to mention is, so in the run up to kind of realising how ill I was, um, I was being coached. And <clears throat> I remember a conversation with my coach where he said, he said, Richard, I, I think I know you quite well now. Um, and I know that the f I know the firm that you work for very well. And I, I completely understand why they want you to be the next managing partner. I completely understand that. What I don't understand is what you want. And I, I looked at him as if to say, I don't understand what you are talking about. I have a wife, I have children, I have a mortgage, I have clients, I have a team, I have responsibilities all over the place. What do you mean? What do I want? And in that lovely way that coaches have, he sort of looked at me and said, I think you might want to reflect on that. And uh, my brain works in metaphors. It, for me, that felt like this, that when you when you first build a house, you start off with the foundations. So you dig your foundations and then you start building off that. And very quickly, you forget about the foundations and you build and you extend and you redevelop. And and after 20 years, you've got this massive edifice of a life. And then one day somebody comes along and says, hmm, you know, those foundations, they're not actually there. And that was how that conversation felt to me, that the basis upon which I had been kind of living, doing stuff for everybody else, pretty much, uh, wasn't perhaps the safest place to go. Um, and I guess what he gave me was the permission to start thinking about what I wanted as opposed to what everybody else wanted. So just wrapping up in terms of me, what happened thereafter? I, uh, after a couple of years of, of, of being away from work, I did some studies and things and then thought, OK, I need to get back to work. Um, I decided that I was, for as long as going back to work meant going back to the law, I was never going to be able to do that, or at least not at the time. So I left my law firm and, and joined Berndine, which is a consultancy that works with organisations to create the kind of workplaces where people can feel safe, where people are, are kinder, fairer and more productive as a result. Um, and I do, as Kevin said, a fair amount of work around kind of training, around ra raising awareness around mental health and mental illness. Um, but we're also involved in various initiatives. I'm going to talk about one later on this morning, this afternoon. Um, but another one which I'm just going to mention is an initiative called This Is Me, which is all around using the power of storytelling to break down the stigma surrounding mental illness. Um, and it is a really powerful um, tool, I think, the power of storytelling. And I guess what I would say to sort of end this little piece is to say this, that there are lots of statistics around there out there around mental illness. One in four of us in the course of any year will experience a diagnosable mental illness. If that's right, which it is, then we all have a story to tell. It might not be about us, it might be about a friend, a colleague, a family member, whatever, but we all have a story. And if we could start telling those stories, then we would reduce the stigma around mental illness overnight. So I'm going to leave that there and hand back to Kevin. Thank you, Richard, for your very uh, personal, very, very inspiring uh, experience and uh, discussing with all of us today. Very much appreciate that. Uh, we, we do have some time now for a question or two from our speakers. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, open up the, the question and answer session now. Uh, if I can put one initially uh, to Emma first. Uh, Emma, it, it, it would seem that much of the way we respond to anxiety is also conditioned on environment, as you mentioned. 
as partners and senior managers, what can we do to foster a less stressful work environment? Great question, uh, Kevin. Um, and especially, I think we're in um, in the, in these new uh, unprecedented times where we all work remotely. We can only see each other over video for most cases. It's really important to foster uh, to to reinforce trust among colleagues, um, and team members, um, and, and we do that by really paying attention to the conversations we have. And asking ourselves, is the quality of our conversation or my conversation, let's say I'm a partner and I, I talk to my team on a regular basis, am I helping them being more secure? Am I uh, ensuring that they are being heard? Am I listening to them and, and their anxiety and their questions? Or am I pushing more instructions and deadlines to them? So by by really paying, of, paying attention to the conversations we have, also, maybe allow allowing more time to talk about what's going on at home. Um, how is the whole situation affecting us? And let them share about that a bit more. And um, and and yes, and and really being aware of the tone we use and and checking in with them, their workloads, um, and 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 co-creating the work together rather than really, you know giving them more work basically which which a lot of managers tend to do i think it's really about paying attention and, and having more dialogue dialogue that fosters trust and and connection especially talking about the more the personal aspect of things that would be my advice great thank you so much for that and, uh, helpful to me and hopefully helpful to others as well uh, richard question to you you've been able to convert your own experience uh, into a pathway to helping others. What was the moment when you first decided that rather than just deal with your own recovery and, and issues, you could put that to good use for others? Gosh, thank you. Um, I guess, I guess they would, well, I'll, I'll say maybe three things. First of all, the, the, there was a time when, uh, which was sort of in 2013, where I realized finally that I had to start doing something to earn some living, earn a living. I couldn't carry on um, not earning any money. I had a number of people who depended upon me, so I needed to do something. Um, and, and going back to law felt too frightening. Um, but then I guess there were, there were two things. First of all, um, there's an element of, there's definitely an element of saying, look, what I went through was really horrendous. Um, and if we can, if we can stop if we can help people s stop getting to that point, that would be really helpful. Um, but I guess there was a realization that I'd spent 20 years as an employment lawyer thinking about what goes on in the workplace and, and had seen it all through the lens of law. Um, and, and then I'd done a load of personal work, but also study in psychotherapy and counseling. And I'd realized that actually the reason why people do stuff is because of what happens in our brains. And if we really want to help workplaces work, operate effectively, we need to understand this and we need to be applying a lens that understands why people do the stuff they do. And so it was a kind of, um, for me, it was almost like there's an elephant in the room here. We're talking about workplaces. We're talking about the way people interact and the things they do and how we can you know, make workplaces more effective and safer and all the rest of it. Understanding this is critical to any of that. Um, so I guess that was a kind of a, 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 a real driver. Um, and, that, and, and through that, helping people get to a, set, a place of being able to, I don't know, connect with the, their, their real selves and understand what they want to be doing in their purpose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard. Appreciate that so much. We, we have time for one more question. We have a question that came in from one of the attendees. So I'm going to push it over to Emma uh, and then allow you, Emma, to go right into your second part of your second of the session after this question. Uh, the question that came in is how to deal with anticipatory grief. What's the first word before grief? I didn't it's how to deal with anticipatory grief. Mm. So really uh, pretty much getting anxious about what hasn't happened yet, yeah. but we foresee. Um, th that's a good question. Again, 
I think really being aware of 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 the stories in our heads, the thoughts, and and again, for most of, mo mo most of the time, we can't help but thinking. I mean, I think we think I can't remember a hundred thousand thoughts a, a day constantly, uh, but 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 just by raising our self awareness, by saying, okay, I have this thought, I have this worry of something that has not happened yet, and if we can do that, noticing what's happening in the brain, and ask ourselves, is this helpful? Is it is there a way I can I can not not think about it? And sometimes it's it's much easier said than done. I'm completely aware of that. But just being aware and say, OK, this is not helpful. It hasn't happened. Let me stay back in the present because the future hasn't arrived. It, it doesn't even exist. So, OK, let me just focus on what's in front of me. And again, it takes willpower and, you know, kind of pushing away that thoughts. But the more you practice, the better you become at it. So that would be again notice it, being aware, and, and consciously pushing it away, staying focused to the present. Right, thank you. And in part two of our webinar, we're going to return to you now for some yeah. guidance on on how we can manage our stress and anxiety in a productive way. Yes, um, and and I just want to to say uh, something here to our, our audience. I mean, Richard shared about his own story, which which obviously it's, it's a case of an extreme. Um, um, extreme depression, if I, if I may say so, where where really it's it's the worst possible case scenario, and of course there's a there's a process, as I said, there's a process by by which uh, one goes through anxiety to high anxiety to high chronic stress, and then and then to to uh, to more um, worse consequences. And and today my aim is really not to give you uh, answers to deal with with depression, heavy depression, but just some few a few tools that you can access easily. Uh, it's free. It's accessible anytime. It takes just a few minutes for most of them. Um, that that kind of prevents um, you from being from getting too stressed or too anxious. Um, so let me share my screen again. Let me share my slides. Um, okay, so here we are. There's actually before I go into the quick strategies to deal with anxiety we face. I wanted to share with you the typical three ways to deal with negative emotions. And here are the two most common one. Generally, when we have a negative emotion, especially when it's quite intense, it comes at us. It's a sudden sadness, for example, or sudden anger, and we feel compelled to act on, on that emotion. Well, we tend to either suppress, we suppress, we, 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 we push them away, we, we try to distract ourselves or deny it. Uh, or avoid, uh, but it's not helping because the emotion is there and it needs to be addressed. Or the other uh, scenario is typically we amplify, we catastrophize. That's usually when the emotion gets the better of us and then we go into deep crying or shouting, uh, but it's not it's not helping because it's we, we, we lost our ability to be functional and to be rational. Now there's a third way, which is more the acceptance uh, uh, allowance. And you see this visual, it, 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 lo it looks a bit like a wave. So think of it as our ability to serve the wave of the emotion. It's about accepting it, naming it, allowing it to, to be part of, of, of ourself, embracing it if we can, and, uh, and, and, and deal with it, right? Instead of getting submerged by it. So it's about surfing the wave rather than <laughs> getting under the wave. And back to our three levels, remember the, men, the mind, the mental, the emotional and the physical. When you are aware that you've been affected, usually you sense it, it often starts at the emotional level, but we feel it physically because our body uh, instinctively reacts. Uh, we feel tension um, in the gut or in the chest uh, or in the, we have you know, ache in, the, in, the, in our shoulder or, or whatever. Um, so, so first, be aware of which which level has been is most affected, and then ask yourself: So, what am I feeling exactly? What sort of emotion am I going through? Try to name that emotion because, again, there's a wide range of emotions we often don't delve into. Am I feeling rejected, abandoned, betrayed, worthless, uh, empty, humiliated, and so on? Um, and then, what am I thinking? What is the sort of thoughts or beliefs that is now in my mind. 
and my physiology. What am I sensing? What's going on in my body? And then you go into the second question. How is it affecting me specifically? Uh, I have a migraine. I lost my appetite. Um, I can't I can't work. I can't concentrate. I can't focus, for example. So all those are good answers to these questions. Now look around. How is it affecting your surroundings, your colleagues, perhaps your spouse, your children? Um, and, and how is it affecting your work? Then the third question is, OK, what is it that I can do? What is it within my control? A skill set I have, tools that I can tap into to address that. And if not, who can help? Um, my, I don't know, my boss, I need to call him or I need to talk to my spouse or I need I need to see my doctor or, or whoever. Um, find someone who can help with what you're dealing right now. And then the, lastly, what what sort of action plan or strategy can I can I can I start designing to to resolve this? If again, if 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 it's resolvable, um, if it's if it's easily resolvable. So all these questions will help you to start strategizing about what to do. Uh, that again, if again, if you're functional and you're you're, you're able to think uh, properly about it, uh, otherwise, really get get some help. Now back to our uh, change curve. Um, again, it's important to so have mapped out the, the three uh, different ways of managing our emotions. So typically the denial we suppress and a lot of us tend to do that because we don't want to see, we don't want to address it. Then we go into anger or, or sadness or anxiety. We can go perhaps into depression uh, and that's where emotions tend to spill out. <clears throat> and then finally acceptance going back uh, on top of the curve and surfing it and letting it go. So I thought in the few minutes I have left to do a simple exercise and there's always instead of me telling you the exercise, why not we practice it together right now? It's just going to take a few uh, minutes and basically I call this exercise being present to the present or the five S's. And the first step, so before we, we do it, let me explain quickly. The first step is is actually stepping out. If we, if we can step out physically, it helps. Let you know if, if we get overwhelmed, we can go for a nice park, uh, walk in the park, or outside the house or the office. Um, that is very helpful. But if not mentally, you can still step out of your state. Then it's about slowing down and, and, and mainly focusing on your breathing because that's the best way to to just being aware of and and being present. And then. Having silence around us is helpful because the silence is often generative and, and soothing, but it can also be a nice relaxing music or birds chirping or um, some people like waterfalls um, <clears throat> and staying still is important, whether you're seated or standing. Find a way to, to still yourself, still your body because it will still your mind. And then lastly, the outcome of that will be you, you your ability to serve the wave or to serve the emotion and then let it go. So if I would ask you to just close your eyes, whether you're seated or standing, if you just close your eyes and go inwards into your inner world. And just start paying attention to what's going on. Perhaps you're sensing some sensation on your body, Maybe some tension on your shoulder. Or you hear some faint sound around you outside the door you're in. Or you, I hear the fan above my head. Very, very slight sound, but I, I sound noiseless. Just pay attention to what's happening around you and also inside you. Then I want you to focus on your breathing, deliberately slowing it down and being aware of the flow of air coming out through your nostrils and breathing in back into your lungs. Just focus on your breathing, slow breathe, very relaxing. And you may have a thoughts coming to your consciousness. Notice it. Oh, hi thoughts. Nice to see you and just. Just let it go. Refocus back on your breathing. 
And then if there's any emotions, good or bad, no judgments, whatever it is, just notice it and let it go. And as you come back to the present and to the room and to the webinar we're in now, you can open your eyes and just be aware of, of how you feel now. Some of us will probably feel relaxed, lighter. Maybe the mind is more still, there's fewer thoughts. We'll feel better, lighter, whatever. Um, th these, this is a very simple exercise you can do in two minutes or in 10. You can be seated or, or standing and it's a, it's, it's, you know, it's free. It's accessible anytime, anywhere, and it really helps you to just being present to the present. So this is something I would like to offer you uh, for you to practice whenever you, you feel like it. Now, the thing, the second uh, quick exercise to do is is going into thankfulness of or, or gratitude or gratefulness. And simply because it's actually impossible to feel a negative emotion and feel feeling grateful at the same time. Try it. I've tried it hundreds of times and I can't do it. The two can't coexist together. And so when you feel that you're going through anxiety or stress or any sort of negative emotions, if you can if you can step into gratitude, maybe think about how grateful you are to be to be surrounded by loving children or loving spouse or having a job you really, really enjoy or still have a job in these times where people are losing job. You know, there's, uh, there's actually plenty of things we can be grateful for when we really think about it. Um, and then automatically you will feel good. You'll, you'll be in a state of, 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 of wellness and, and, and joy. And actually, research shows that uh, the happiest people are deeply grateful and appreciative of, of life and the little things. And I want to invite you, if you're not doing it already, to have a, a gratitude exercise. Um, you can do it on a daily basis, have an actual notebook and just write what you are grateful for. I do that at the end of the day, three things I'm grateful about that has happened during the day and it helps me sleep much better, actually. So. Um, again, this is a really quick exercise, easy to do. Just take a few minutes, um, but I, 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 I hope that it can help you to really quickly snap out of a negative state or negative emotion. So is that um, back to you, Kevin? Wow, thank, thank you very much, Emma, and, and I am truly grateful to you for, for your presentation on that and the slides she presented that, so I am grateful there. Uh, we now are going to return again to Richard uh, for his discussion of the Mindful Business Charter. I'll turn it over to you, Richard. Thank you, Kevin, <clears throat> and thank you, Emma. I I feel relaxed and 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 not ready to do a presentation uh, across uh, the the internet. Um, and I just want to pick up on one of those things that Emma was talking about right at the beginning of that piece around around being aware of our thoughts because. Um, well, one of my favorite kind of sayings at the moment um, for when I'm feeling a little bit anxious, feeling a little bit stressed, feeling a little bit overwhelmed, just because I think something, it doesn't make it true. Um, and so often I find that the thoughts I'm having because I'm catastrophizing or whatever it may be, the thoughts I'm having just aren't true. And it's too easy, I think, for us to assume that because we are thinking something, because it's occurred in our brain, it must be right very often. I'm afraid what goes on in our brain isn't. Um, so moving on, Emma was kind of focusing there on things that we can do to help ourselves. Um, I want to talk about something that is um, about what organisations can be doing. Um, and it's, a, it's an initiative that um, came about in discussions between um, the, the legal team at Barclays and a couple of their law firms that they work with. And the conversation kind of went like this, that they recognised that there's an awful lot of stress in the way in which we work. <clears throat> and stress is not good. Stress causes all of those bad things that Emma was talking about um, in the first part of her presentation, which makes it much more difficult for us to work effectively um, as well as to work healthily. So 
and, and when we're stressed because of the amygdala hijack that Emma was talking about and our prefrontal cortex stops operating, our cognitive functioning is reduced. Stress is not good for us. It's not good for us personally. It's not good for the work we do. It's not good for the organisation we work for. It's not good for our clients. So if we can remove some of that stress, that would be helpful. So the thinking was. And then they thought, yeah, some of the stress that we have is just kind of goes with our goes with the work that we do. But some of it is unnecessary and some of it is because of the way in which we work with each other, particularly service providers and their clients. And so if we could collaborate and talk to each other about what's going on, then we might be able to work out ways of relating with each other and working with each other that reduce some of the unnecessary stresses that go on um, and thereby making our working culture both healthier but also more effective, more productive, more efficient. So they came up with this idea of a charter, the Mindful Business Charter, um, and they wanted to make it very simple. Uh, they wanted to make it something that all organisations could say, yeah, that makes sense. And so they built it around four very simple pillars. The idea being that if we can focus upon these four areas, we can hopefully reduce that unnecessary stress. But emphasizing throughout the importance of this being a collaboration. Um, so four, four pillars, and I'm going to run through them very briefly, but I'm sure we can circulate details um, after the session. Um, the, first pillar, the first pillar is all around openness and respect building trust and effective communication, talking to each other about how we're working and the impact it's having upon us. And this might sound revolutionary, but it isn't. Saying to a, cl a client, look, yeah, if you, if you need this piece of work by tomorrow morning, I will give it to you by tomorrow morning. But please know that that will mean I will be working all night and so will my team. And so if you don't need it for tomorrow morning, could we have a bit more time? Um, saying to a client, you know, when you do X, Y, Z, that causes me a real problem. Um, so could you stop doing that, for example? And this requires bravery, obviously. Um, and it began with lawyers and I, I, I'm an ex-lawyer, as I said, um, and I know that lawyers are typically quite shy, quite, quite cautious about kind of pushing back to their clients. But because this charter works on the basis of bilateral commitment, I know that my client is on board and so that when I do say something to my client, I know that my client will respond in an appropriate way. Um, so the first pillar about openness and respect. Um, second pillar is about how we communicate. Um, and again, just kind of running through this very briefly, but thinking about meetings, just do we need to have the meeting? Who, needs, who actually needs to be there? Can we make the meeting as short as possible? Can we have a clear agenda? Can we allow people to, to dial in remotely? You know, obviously we've, we've realized in the time of COVID that actually most of what we do, we can do remotely. So rather than making people waste time traveling to meetings, let's make them virtual. Let's think about the time we're having meetings. So very kindly, Zico have timed this webinar to coincide with my time in London, which means that I didn't have to get up at three in the morning. Let's be mindful of that. Let's be respectful of that. Um, with our emails, just because I can copy everybody in the world into my emails, it doesn't mean I should. So think about who actually needs to receive the email. Think about when we're sending it. What's the impact of me emailing people at 10 o'clock at night? Um, you know, that may work for me, but what's the impact upon the people receiving it? So a big emphasis here on just thinking, being thoughtful, um, being mindful. Rest periods. So we've kind of got to a stage in our working where we seem to expect to be on demand 24 seven. And it was bad before COVID. I think it's got even worse now that we're all working from home and there is no kind of demarcation between our work and our home lives. Um, and so this is really a call to to change the assumption. Um, and rather than assume that we are always available, let's assume that when we're on holiday, when it's the weekend, when it's the evening, let's assume that we're not working unless we need to be. Of course, if you need me to do something whilst I'm at, 
on holiday or at the weekend. I will if you need me to. But let's only do it when we need to. Um, an example of this was um, so Lloyds Bank is one of the, the signatories of the Charter and they last last summer, all of their general counsel didn't take their work phones with them on holiday. And they said to everybody in their team, as well as their external clients, they said, look, of course, if you need us, contact us. You've got our personal um, mobile numbers. Call us if you need to. But we're not taking our work phones with us. So we won't be looking at our email as a matter of course. And, and that was a huge impact because they suddenly weren't spending all of their holiday checking emails. And then when people did need to contact them, they actually had to stop and think. You know, my instinct is I want to call Kevin and ask for his input, but actually I'm now going to have to phone him on his personal mobile number. Is it really that important or could I work it out for myself without bothering him? So again, kind of just being more thoughtful. Um, and within that also is the is, is allowing people to set some boundaries and say, look, actually, you know, I because of childcare or because I do yoga or because I just need some downtime or whatever it might be, these are my hours. This is when I'm available and this is when I'm not available. Um, and then how does this work internally? The fourth pillar around delegation. So thinking about how we delegate internally. Um, and the um, it began with three banks, RBS, Lloyds and Barclays and nine law firms in October 2018. But now we've got 54 organisations um, involved and um, and they're in a whole range of sort of business areas. Obviously, there's a big focus on law, but the problems that the charter looks to solve and the solutions it comes up with are not unique to the legal profession at all. Um, and although it began in London, very definitely an international um, aspect to this. Um, and we are talking to organisations around the world around how we can encourage them to get involved. Um, and I know that Zyko, Zico are very, very much on board with this and a number of the organizations there clearly are very much global in nature um, and i hope also that the kind of names on there will indicate that this isn't about not working hard this isn't about slacking this is about how do we do the difficult important high pressured work that we have to do how do we do it in the most healthy the most effective way um, so just to finish off um, if you're interested get in touch um, but you don't have to kind of get on board with the charter. You don't have to sign the charter to um, to think about some of those pillars and to think about how they might be relevant to your working practices, both internally, but also in the way in which you work with other third parties. Um, that'll do for me. I'm going to hand back to Kevin because we've got some time for questions. Right. Thank you, Richard, for that. That's so important uh, in terms of building relationships between clients and, and their lawyers and, and the great, great work that you've done. Incredible. Uh, we do have some time for some questions and uh, I'm going to put the first one back to Emma again. Emma, in terms of what we've, we, we're dealing with, she told us what we should deal. What should we not deal? Uh, what should we not be doing when we deal with stress? There are things that we probably shouldn't be doing. What are those? Yeah, great question, uh, Kevin. Um, <clears throat> so as human beings, we often tend to go to the you know easy solution. We have um, impulse, I would say, and especially when we're triggered, again, we can't think properly and we tend to be to make a lot of wrong choices. So stress and anxiety will, will manifest in different ways for different people, but generally we see uh, we see a lot of people, for example, drinking too much or going to, you know, alcohol as a way to to, to numb um, the pain or, or the, the emotions, the strong emotions they're they are going through or overeating. Um, those are two uh, or can be also, you know, smoking too much. So all those are behaviors that are really not helpful. Um, it affects deeply our health, our, um, our well-being and people around us. So um, again, Addiction is, yes, I mean, there's a lot of uh, sort of different addictions around, but it, it tends to be a, a typical behavior that one goes uh, to um, if, if yeah, I mean, dealing with, with high emotions. So we need to pay attention. OK, I've been triggered. And before we go into that unhelpful behavior, again, seek help or, or find a way to cope uh, with what's happening. Hope that's helpful. 
Yes, thank you very much, Em. Appreciate that. Uh, and, and now a question over to you, Richard. Uh, und undoubtedly, you've, re you've received much positive feedback in your work with the Mindful Business Charter. But have you received any negative feedback? And, and how have you dealt with that and incorporated that into your learning? Um, I could answer by saying that the way in which I deal with the stress of negative feedback is I just ignore it and pretend that it wasn't there. Um, the absolutely and i think um so a couple of thoughts around around that um one of the one of the kind of criticisms if you like has been um that this is this is unrealistic that our clients won't get involved our clients demand this our clients demand that how can we possibly um try and, and work with them in different ways and and i know from my experience as a lawyer that that is a very that's a very real feeling uh, and i and i i, I absolutely recognize that um, and certainly there will be some clients for whom that is the case. But the the response, the feedback that we've had from so many clients as well as law firms is that they absolutely want to have a discussion on this level. Um, one of the general counsel at Barclays said to me very early on, she said, I don't come to work every day to hurt people. I don't want to be hurting people. And if, it, if I am, I want them to tell me. Um, so I think. So that would be one thing, and I think also you know, even where we are working with clients that we know are not going to be or we think are not going to be receptive, we can always try and if they're not fine, but we can still be thinking about what we can do internally. Um, and I guess the other sort of criticism I'd mention is that you know, people say, oh, yeah, well, so and so law firm, they're signed up to the charter, but look at what they're doing. Look at the way they're behaving. And you think, yeah, absolutely. There is an, there is inconsistency because this is not about being perfect. Nobody will say I've signed the charter and suddenly I have changed everything about it, the way I operate overnight and we are now in heaven. Of course not. It is a journey. And and what we need um, what we need is is the time and the support and the permission to make progress and to be called out when we're um, when we're not living up to it. I was um, I was putting together a panel for something uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I I'd emailed a number of different people to say, could you, um, you know, are you available, etc. And and everybody individually came back saying yes, but they also replied re replied to all, so everybody was copied in on the, the responses. And then I was replying to everybody saying thanks. And one of the people said, could you stop replying to everybody saying thanks? Because it's just blocking up my inbox. And you think, yeah, good point. Um, we have to be receptive to being called out. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you both. Uh, but thank you both to our speakers, Emma and Richard, very much. We appreciate your being here with us and sharing your valuable insights and, and resources and experiences with us. We did receive other questions from attendees and we will be passing those on to you uh, for answering offline. So we appreciate that. And to our attendees, thank you for your questions and we will respond to you. Uh, I would like to also thank everyone for attending this webinar. You've been a great audience and we hope that you enjoyed the session. The presentation slides and recording of this webinar will be sent to you in an email and they are available on our website together with more resources. Anxiety, stress, and mental health issues are serious and affect many persons. We encourage you to contact the resources we will provide you in the email should you ever find yourself in need of support or guidance. Do join us next Wednesday for our webinar, Reopening Indonesia, Legal Updates on Key Sectors. That's on Wednesday, next week, 1 July, at 11 a.m. Kuala Lumpur time. Invitations will be sent out to those who have subscribed to our mailing list, so please keep an eye out for them. Alternatively, you may wish to visit our events page at zico.group. Once again, thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a pleasant week. Thank you.